Welcome everybody. My name is Ruth Rose and I'm a member of the Adult Programs Committee here at First Parish. Uh, this is our first uh, talk of our fall Tuesday talks and we are very uh, privileged to have as our first speaker uh, Tony Tasker. So uh, I just want to say that Tony is a long-standing member of First Parish. She and Pete joined the church in the 80s and have been active ever since. Uh, Tony has been chair of the Music Committee and the Social Action Committee, and she currently chairs the Buildings and Grounds Committee. Uh, the ongoing work at the church is testament to her many skills. And she is a stalwart, long-standing member of the choir who often um, sings soprano solos. So we're pretty lucky to have her. Uh, Tony started her research into uh, that we'll hear about today just about 10 years ago. And she credits her research skills to the years she taught at Simmons College as part of fulfilling her professional doctorate in physical therapy. She is fluent in French and Spanish and a thoroughly delightful person. So we're very lucky to have Tony to get, uh, talk to us today. I want to do just a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Um, uh, we, uh, Tony will uh, give her entire pre presentation and then we will have a few minutes for questions at the end. Um, and if you want to ask a question, it's probably best if you use the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and one of the choices is to raise your hand. And then you will have to unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, okay, I think that's everything. So I'm gonna hand this over to Tony. Thank you, Tony. Well, thank you, Ruth, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I wish I could say I really was fluent in French and Spanish, but I can get by just fine. But <laughs> thank you for that, um, that promotion. Um, I'm gonna just uh, take some time today to talk about a wonderful adventure that Pete and I had over the last decade to, to make real a story that I heard when I was a child. And it took a lot of work, um, but it was mostly a whole lot of fun. So I am gonna share my screen right now so that you can see. Uh, what, where did it go, Pete? Uh, just a minute, it's not there. I have to click it one more time, obviously. Mm -hmm. Star Trek. What's that? Star Trek. Oh, you got it. Here we go. Uh, yeah, on the left, Star Trek. Wait a second. There we go. Okay, so this is a, about my tenacity, and um, certainly it's uh, you know persevering and being determined. And my mother would probably tell you that I was a very stubborn child, and so I very easily. Um, so when I was a child and visiting my my grandparents, whom um, this is how I knew them. Uh, my grandfather, Calvin Southwick, and my grandmother, Antoinette Degenar Southwick, and I'm named after her. My real name is Antoinette. Um, there was always a picture on their, my grandfather's dresser of this little girl, and I didn't know who she was, and I, the story that I heard at the time was she was the daughter in a French farm family that took care of my grandfather when he was sick during World War I with the Spanish flu. And, you know, I was just a dumb kid, so I didn't ask many more questions. And um, as I got older, it really wasn't okay to ask my grandfather or even my father who fought in, in World War II in Iwo Jima. He just didn't talk about the war. It was behind them. So, I didn't know much about it, but I started getting curious about 10 years ago. And, and 
any excuse to go to France was fine with me. So I um, started doing my investigation. And this is my grandfather, Private Calvin Southwick, when I was taken in about 1918 when he was 22. And as I started asking questions about this, my grandparents had died, my parents had died, my aunt and uncle also had died. So no one really had the story to tell me. So I asked my cousin Calvin, who had a big trunk of things that were uh, from his uh, grandfather, and he was able to give me a little bit of information that my grandfather was a machine gunner in the war. He was a runner, you know, where you take uh, information or orders from one place to another and a wire tracer. So I thought, okay, uh, now I'm gonna dig into this. So I knew that there were records that were kept in the army archives. And so I made an inquiry at the National Personnel Records Center for the army archives. And unfortunately, they had a big fire in their warehouse in 1973, and all the army records from 1912 to 1959 were burned up. Okay, first roadblock. Well, where else could I find that? New York State Archives, because my grandfather was from New York. So I contacted them, and they in fact sent me his induction card. And it says that he uh, went in on May 27th or, or overseas on May 27th in 18 and came out the same date in 19. So then there's all this gobbledygook here, 153 Debrig to Abelba COC 309 MG. And I didn't know what that meant at all. So went online and what I found out was that he was in the American Expeditionary Forces First Army, 78th Division, 156th Brigade, and the 309th Machine Gun Battalion, which was uh, fought with the 311th and 12th Infantry Battalions and Company C. So I said, great, oh, well, I know what division he was with in the Army, but how do I find out more information? Well, lo and behold, you can go to a book on a particular, a particular division. And this is the history of the 78th Division during World War I. And it was written, I think, in the 20s. It's really quite flowery and, and you know, it sounded like a great adventure these people were on. Um, the 78th was called the Lightning Division and they were troops from New York and New Jersey. And you had a day-by-day -day account of where they were and the battles that they fought during the, the uh, time they were in theater. And this was the route that they took. They were sent initially from Fort Dix to Southern um, Great Britain, across into Calais, went down to Bourbon-les-Bains, which was where they had another um, sort of staging area. And the first battle that they fought was in um, Saint-Miguel, um, which was part of the uh, Meuse-Argonne offensive, um, all in this uh, Champagne-Ardennes region of northeastern um, France. And so I thought, great, well, like, okay, I know where he was. So how do I find out where he was sick? And I didn't even know anything about the Spanish flu either. So I thought I'd better start there. Maybe I'll get some information about where there were these great outbreaks of the flu. Little did I know. So this wonderful book was written by John Barry. I guess this is one of the, the better um, stories about the, the Spanish flu. And um, I learned an awful lot about it. It's quite a thick book. So you can learn about the, the infancy of uh, epidemiology at, at Johns Hopkins, um, about some of the ideas they had about what the influenza was and how to treat it. It was actually a very fascinating book. So. I, what I learned and you know, I knew that an awful lot of young people died from this, which is not the usual case. What you usually see is this, let me get my cursor in the right place here. This is what would normally happen. This is the curve of the deaths. And it's usually very young people and very old people that will die from the flu. But with this particular one, 
it had this big spike in the middle of it. They're calling it a W-shaped curve. And the strain, this particular strain of the virus, which actually is H1N1, like our current virus, um, struck young adults that were 20 to 40 years old. And they, they hypothesized that the reason they, that group was so sick when they were young and strong was that their immune response was very strong and they over-responded. Um, it was a very, uh, or the body over-responded in response to this virus. It was very virulent, um, a high rate of, of uh, transmission. People sometimes died a day or two after they contracted it. And there were very um, a high rate of severe uh, lung complications and a progression rapidly to pneumonia. It was our, it, and still is our deadliest um, uh, disease, I guess, in history. It was worse than the back, Black Plague. They think that a, a third of the world's, world's population was infected from 18 to 19, and uh, somewhere between 50 and 100 million people died. And interestingly, more soldiers died of the influenza in combat during World War I than they did from injuries that they sustained in the battle. Remember, this is a time when they, they really didn't know about viruses, they knew about bacteria, they didn't have antibiotics, they didn't have any antivirals as we do today. There were three waves of this. The first one was early in 1918, and there were some deaths from that, but not a whole lot. And then as mutations occurred, I'm sure, there was a big spike in the fall and, um, and early winter of uh, 1918. And then a third wave that was here in the winter of, of 1919. It was severe, but there were a lot fewer deaths during that time. This is another way of looking at it with this smaller spike and then a, a, a big spike and then a one that was um, uh, less than that, but still severe. But when I look at this, I, know, I realize it only stopped in 2004, but it gives me a lot of hope for COVID finally going away because you see that it just gradually kind of more enough people became um, immune to it or, they, or their antibodies had grown so that they didn't succumb to it. But uh, over time, it just kind of faded off to nothingness. So I hope that is what will happen with COVID. They don't really know where the virus started. They think it started in this uh, Fort Funston in Kansas where the first US troops at least encountered the flu and deaths from the flu. Um, they believe that it hit Spain before the rest of Europe in early 1918, but then the second wave hit the, the, um, the more Eastern parts of Europe with the deadliest peak in October, 1918. So why is it called the Spanish flu? Well, it was a time when there was a lot of um, suppression of anything negative about the war. So no one in England, France, or even Germany was gonna say that our troops were dropping like flies with this, this virus. Um, so because Spain was neutral during the war, they said, must have started in Spain, so we're gonna call it the Spanish flu. <laughs> So as we all know, the way you transmit the flu is by aerosol droplets and coughing, sneezing, even talking. And what they did is they just crowded the troops, thousands of them on these troop ships to go over to Europe. Um, 2000 soldiers might be on this boat and they, they, after a while they began to call them floating coffins because they just had to bury a lot of the troops at sea because there was a high incidence of death. Then when they got to France, they transported them by trains and again, stuffed them into the trains. Um, so there was a lot, of, um, a lot of transmission of the virus going on. So then I thought, well, well maybe if, if I know where my grandfather was, then maybe when he got sick there, he would go into a military hospital so I can look in the files of the military hospitals. Well, this was a typical influenza ward. And you can see they don't have the modern techniques that we use today, no masks, no isolation, uh, very crowded. Um, so I thought, well, maybe, maybe when I get to France, let's go to France and find this out. 
um, because I'll use any excuse to go to France. Let's see what we can find out when we get there. So we went off to the battlefields to see where records might be kept and where he had been. So this is one of the, the French monuments to the First World War. So the Americans were began here in the um, in this area of France. They by this time in September, this was sort of the line that the the Allies had kept. And the Americans were in this region right here with their goal of going to Sedan and then pushing the troops, the German troops back across the border. So they started out with a battle in San Miguel and that was in uh, middle of September to early October. And then they did a 20 mile march to this area of the Meuse Argonne region. It's very forested. Uh, there are very few roads, lots of mines that the Germans had left because remember they had been in this area for almost four years. Um, so they tended to be in the woods and it was really sort of a natural fortress for them. So the American troops began in mid um, October and they went right until Armistice Day with their battle. They were mostly in the town of, for three weeks fighting in the town of Grand Pré. And Grand Pré had a citadel up on the hill that the Germans were um, fortified. They were in all the woods that were around and then the large fields there were, were just open for them, for um, the allies to be shot in. They had trenches, um, you know, um, machine gun nests, underground living quarters. You've probably seen some of those all over the Western Front. So about a third of my grandfather's battalion was lost, was killed during that time. Um, lots of the troops became disconnected. There were many people who were sick. So there, it was just, I guess, an incredible mess. You might have seen the movie, The Lost Battalion. That was where um, uh, Private Alan York, Alvin York, who was from New York City, who was a lawyer, I guess, um, in the 77th Division, he got his troops out of there, even though they were trapped and um, they were able to you know, take a lot of German prisoners as well. Um, it's a very interesting movie. So I've still left the French word for this la boue. I think it's kind of onomatopoetic. It's like, it's mud. It, there was mud everywhere. And any of the movies that you've seen about World War I, you see mud and water and rain and just a mess everywhere. And these are trying to get the, the um, supplies to the troops. These are the ambulances that they used, and you know the casualties were very heavy, but they could not, they were stuck in the mud. They couldn't bring the wounded or the dead back to the lines, and often they had to wait till nighttime to do that. And this is what the rear looked like. Apparently there were traffic jams there, things moved at about two miles an hour, and it was not, um, an easy thing to, to um, get the wounded or the ill soldiers out. So this is what Grand Pré looked like after the three weeks. It, it was pretty much destroyed. And some of the center was, was still looked like it had, there were buildings there. But when we visited it, there was a building that was still existing there from uh, the war. The citadel had been destroyed up on the hill. Um, the, uh, the church was there, though restored. Um, so I thought, all right, so if this was such a mess and my grandfather got sick there and somebody just dragged him into their farm and took care of them, how was I ever gonna find out about him? So I kept looking to see whether there were records in the military hospitals. But I found this quote that was really amazing. As the American soldiers came ever closer to final victory, the field medical service came even closer to total disaster. And there really, there were no records. So we did visit this American cemetery that was at um, Romagne sous Montfaucon, 14,000 um, graves are there. There were um, 5,000 that were just in the 78th Battalion. We told the story to a ton of different people there in the visitor centers or at the 
cemetery headquarters and they love the story. So one woman burst into tears. She says to me in French, oh, it's so poignant, this story. And, and one guy said to me, vous êtes tenace. You have a lot of, of um, stubbornness or, or gumption to keep doing this. So we had planned to go on the second week down to the Burgundy area where my uh, grandfather was billeted after the war. If you remember that you know, we, uh, a lot of the, um, the privately held uh, ships were used um, to transport the troops over. But when, after the armistice, they went back into their regular duties. So there weren't a lot of, of um, troop sh ships available to transport the soldiers back home. So they stayed on for six months. And I found in this wonderful book about the 78th Battalion that my grandfather was billeted in this little town called marigny le cawe that was outside of Dijon. And it was a really sweet little village. Um, and I, I saw also in the back of this, um, this book about the 78th Battalion that there was a list of those who died of disease, not just those who died of war. And um, there were many machine gunners that were there in this in Marine de Cahue, and I thought, well, maybe there's a chance that my grandfather was sick there. So I wrote to the mayor of, of Marine de Cahue, Eric Squadana, and he invited us to come. But first he said, I'm going to do like a wanted poster. I sent him a picture of, of my grandfather in his Slingerland's New York baseball outfit. <laughs> um, and he said, you know, asked people in his town, population 291, um, if they had heard anything about American soldiers being billeted there and any story that might be about my grandfather. And there was nothing. But he said, you must come and I have some records from World War I and I'd love to meet you and come to the mairie, the, um, the village hall uh, on a certain date and time. So we did. And this is um, the mayor right here and two of the people that worked with him and Pete and me um, in front of the castle in the town. And he had this, he gave us a tour of the town and um, he had given me a, a lot of papers that he had copied from their archives but he really didn't have any specific information about my grandfather. So um, he took us into this great hall that they have in the, the town center that has all the presidents of France that are in it and a, a statue of um, uh, the woman who is the symbol of, of liberty, uh, Marianne. And I was taking French at the time with Karen Girondal and she said, you're gonna to have to talk because he's gonna do his big expose and then you're gonna to have to talk. So I did and I talked about the French-American friendship that has uh, lasted since the Revolutionary War here in the US um, uh, with General de Lafayette who helped our troops in New York. Um, Paul Revere, actually, his father came from France. He was a Huguenot a refugee. Um, I talked about World War I, working together to finish the war, D-Day. And I brought him a, a, a Delft blue and white plate from Lexington Center that I got that had Paul Revere and you know a little bit about Lexington. And they thought it was fabulous. So it was really a lovely evening and I'm, I'm very glad we had that, but that's all I knew. And that was the end of our, our two weeks there. And I decided that if this is where he was sick and this is where someone took care of him and spent six months, what a beautiful way to end his, his terrible time fighting the war um, before that. So that was, that was the end of the story. Well, a year or two later, my cousin Christine called and she said, you got to sit down. I found something in a box called Skeletons in the Closet. She was cleaning out her mother's home and found this in her basement. So there was this lovely embroidered card that was, you know, was, was hand embroidered. 
And on the reverse side, it said, your little friend from France has not forgotten you. She's happy to send you from Chasse her best wishes of happiness for the year that's going to begin. Merry Christmas to Mademoiselle, your sister, and to you. With all my love, or literally, I embrace you with all my little heart, Gabrielle Briande. I now had a name and I had a town. And Chasse is two kilometers away from Marigny le Carré. So we were close. So I went to, I got I had to figure out, well, where are the Briandes? Um, so I went to the French um, uh, census from 1921. And here is Jean-Louis Briandet, who is a cultivateur or a farmer. He was the head of the family, his wife Anastasie, his daughter Marie, his daughter Felicier, and his granddaughter Gabrielle Briandet. So this really confirmed that this was the family that took care of my grandfather the grandparents, my mother and, and um, Gabrielle's aunt, and they were farmers. So the French farm family story that I heard as a kid was confirmed by this. So I said, okay, so where do their descendants live today? I went on Google with the name, there's nothing. Uh, I belong to ancestry.com. There were a lot of other Briandes, but not in France. And the French do not really make public a lot of the um, information about their citizens until a hundred years after, I guess they died or something like that. But so it was very difficult. So what I had to do, I also, um, what I had to do was join a French um, ancestry website. And lo and behold, there was one family tree by a person named Virginie Bolletet. And so I said, okay, well, I'm going to start here. And I went, I sent her an email, which sometimes you can do on a website, but I didn't get anything back. So I went to whitepages.com for French, France, and I found Virginie and her father. Could, uh, I knew from the, the family tree that his name was, um, right now I'm forgetting it, but at any rate, um, uh, Guillaume, not Guillaume, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, and, and I found the address. So I sent a letter by good old snail mail to them. And I got an email back from Virginie saying that they were in fact the family of Gabrielle. So we said, gotta go back to France again. So here is the family, Jean, of course. So there's Jean, there's me, there's Jean Saint Guillaume. There's Virginie who told us she had to do this family tree and when she was in high school. It was required of all the, the people there. And I said, thank you so much. And this is Annick, um, uh, Jean's uh, wife and Pete. And so I, in, I invited them over this again, thank you, um, uh, my French teacher. Um, thank you for telling me that what they love to do is get together for a big long lunch on a Sunday. So I found a place to stay and we invited them over for a Sunday dinner. And I made an American meal, which, you know, it's hard to say what American meal is, but at least we ended up with brownies and ice cream. Um, and um, Gabrielle, Gabrielle apparently had died 10 years before and her son Jean had, didn't have any stories from World War I. He said it was a real hard scrabble life that they, they lived before the war and it was worse afterward. And they raised grain and animals and just tried to make it make a living. Um, Gabrielle married before World War II. And unfortunately her husband was taken as a, a POW in Germany, but did, did survive and return. And he said just generally in his family, they were hardworking and there was no time for talking, just working. So they brought us all these wonderful gifts of the, you know, the Burgundy region. And we brought them, I brought them uh, also another plate 
and I brought them a, a little family album of pictures of the 39 and a half descendants that would not be here for one for my grandmother, my grandfather surviving. The half was that my cousin was pregnant. Um, and he also had a, an army shaving kit that um, his mother had been given by a soldier, perhaps my grandfather, I don't know. And um, he remembers the picture of an American soldier that was in his parents' home when he was growing up. So he gave me a picture of Gabrielle in her later years. And he said, she just, everybody loved her. And I can understand why my grandfather also did. Um, it was, we were there um, on Toussaint or All Saints Day. And the tradition is to leave flowers on the grave of someone in, that important to you. So we brought flowers and we actually were able to um, look, visit the farm that they owned, where I'm sure my grandfather was cared for during the time. Well, we were staying with this wonderful landlady, Patricia, who said, I have arranged for you to be interviewed by the local newspaper, the, the Bien Public for this area, the Haute Côte d'Or, and there is someone coming tomorrow to interview you. So this lovely young guy came and interviewed us and took pictures. And then, um, you know, we were actually the centerfold in this, this paper. This kind of like the, the Minuteman. And he wrote this wonderful story. Um, and one of the things that he, when he interviewed the Boletés, he said that, um, he, he quoted Jean saying, I didn't know that my mother had sent letters to an American soldier. It was just their shared memory, their common story. With her family, my mother took care of this soldier during his illness. She helped, <clears throat> excuse me, she helped care for him and saved his life. What a great pleasure to learn this story 97 years later. So this family was in fact descendants of, a, of you know, just a, average farm family. Um, they were working in um, a factory and as a trucker and, you know, but were just the nicest, kindest people in the world. And they did, during our time there, they did invite us over to their home. And uh, we had some wonderful sweets that, that Virginie had made. And they came to the, the train station to say goodbye to us. So I think this was as wonderful an event for them <laughs> as it was for us. So in all the things that were in this um, skeletons in the, in the closet was a pillow cover that um, my grandfather had saved. And Jean thought perhaps his mother might have embroidered it. I don't know. But I just thought it was a fitting symbol of the memories, the old ones and the new ones that we have of this French farm family that meant so much to my grandfather. So... Thank you again for letting me tell this story. It, it is very dear to my heart. And um, that is all I'm gonna say right now. So let me come back to life here. Um, I have to stop screen sharing, which happens up here. And there I am. Okay. Need water. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, that was thunderous applause from <laughs> all the muted people. Uh, uh, that is such a great story. It really is just very affecting. And um, anyway, so we will open uh, our time up for questions or comments. Uh, and I think because we fit on one screen, if you want to just raise your hand, you can do that, or you can go to the response button at the bottom of your screen and raise your hand. So I actually have a question, Tony, and then David yes. Horton. Um, how long and maybe you said this, from the time you started your research until you found, until you met the family of uh, Gabrielle, how long, 
How much time had gone by? It was probably 10 years, on, you know, from the initial seeing what my cousin might have in that big trunk in his, in his attic um, to just learning how, where I needed to go to find this information. Um, so it was a good, probably a good six years before <coughs> we actually um, went to France and no, it was longer than that. It was a long battle. Um, so I ha actually have a whole list of websites and, and resources that I used if anybody wanted to do this. Um, actually, Marty Qual, um, I helped her to find where her um, great uncle was actually killed and where he was buried in, in France. Um, so if, if you know if you're use, if you're interested in doing some of these searches that take you back and take you to someplace interesting, I, I if you just email me, I can share the resources I had. Terrific. I think Meg has a question. And uh, David uh, Horton, I think, was before Meg. Go ahead, Meg. I'll I'll go next after you. Oh, she's. Go ahead, I Meg. Go. I I I have a question, but I just want to start with. What a wonderful way you told that story, and um, and how how widely the search took you, and 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 how much you learned about <laughs> all sorts of things, and um, it was just fascinating. So um, I guess my question is, what were the many gifts for you of your tenacity? <laughs> I can't believe that you were able to keep it going over 10 years. <laughs> I know. Well, I really like to go to France. So <laughs> it was not, I needed some excuse, I guess. Um, I think, I think as I got little pieces of information along the way, um, I had a lot to learn about the flu. And I have to say, I was wildly ignorant about it. And I think it was just something that not a lot of families talked about. Many people since have told me, oh, my grandparents died during that, or, you know, to learn bodies were piled up in the street. And it was just um, really an amazing time. And I, I am just really ashamed to not know much about that. So I think as I got each new piece of information, it really impelled me to keep going like I you know I can find out some things and having the luck of of finding this book about his his uh, battalion I know there are many many more books that are written about you know specific battalions um so it's possible to find out things I just thought okay I'm getting closer now and 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 then to go there there was something that was really wonderful about the possibility. Unfortunately, that was it. That was all we could find out until my cousin found that card. And had she not found that card and known that I was looking, because I had asked everybody, did your mother tell you anything? Um, uh, that if she hadn't found that card, it would have stopped on that first trip in uh, with the mayor. Feels like the universe was out to help you. Something. <laughs> it really was great. And by the way, I would just say that my husband's aunt was a victim of the flu too. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, maybe her husband brought it back. I, I don't really remember. Uh, David. Uh, three little things. One is Henry Louis Gates could use you. you know, <laughs> and so if you're looking for... Uh, uh, Another career, I'm sure Henry Louis Gates could oh, oh. would would be love to have you. Uh, the other the other is just your your story. But those are wonderful. It, it, it's it's more than just a it's not not just a story. It's it's a link to life. But it reminds me a bit of, of our theme of uh, soul matters about belonging and about how we um, we yearn for connections with people and and when we make them. Uh, how enriching it is it just uh, and i sensed that in you and i was feeling that while you were telling us about your grandfather meeting the family and how how the, you reacted to the family and vice versa it's just those the, those human connections those, those the human cords are so significant yes. uh, also uh, one cookie 
Is that the pillow slip on the wall behind you? It is. It is. <laughs> well, you probably, probably saw a better a better picture of it. No, don't you, you use it wouldn't, and you, it wouldn't come up so well. <laughs> and you brought that with you to France. You showed it to them. I did. Yeah. I did. And then um, then I said, well, this is really special, and it, it it reminds me of it, and it is a um, you know part of my family history. Absolutely. I don't have a lot of other things that were from that generation. I I have things from my parents certainly, but not. For, from my uh, my grandparents' generation, so yeah, it was really and and I also feel so wonderful that it became a really meaningful thing for the Bolite family, mm -hmm. and I think they were just floored by it. They would never in their life have thought they would be the centerfold in this um, this local paper. It <sighs> just, um, they're really yeah, I'm happy for them too. Thank you, Tony. You're welcome. <laughs>